The ability to tell a truth from a lie has been of long interest to human beings, being that, you know, we lie so damn much. Detecting lies has been explored through examining body language, logical inconsistencies in stories, and more recently, through the use of lie detection technology, most notably, the polygraph. The idea that we can accurately detect deceit through hardwired biology is an attractive one. However, polygraphs have a notorious history of being unreliable. A lack of reliability is dangerous when the law is involved and people's lives are at stake. The desire for better methods of lie detection has led some scientists to look to the brain, to see if we can observe changes in brain activity associated with lying and develop a kind of model of the neurobiology of deceit. The premise being that the thoughts and cognitive abilities that go into lying are different than those that go into telling the truth, and so would therefore rely on different brain structures. Brain structures that can be identified using neuroimaging techniques like fMRI. So in this video, I'm going to cover what fMRI is, how it works, the research behind lying, and the neurobiology of truth versus deception, whether or not it can be reliably used in a court of law as a means of lie detection for individuals and their cases. fMRI stands for Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging. It's a type of brain imaging technology and technique that doesn't just show the neuroanatomy of the brain structures, but produces images of the function of these brain structures in relation to behaviors and perceptions. So typically what will happen is that a scientist uh, will stick a patient into this massive multi-million dollar hypermagnetic tube and ask him to do some little test or, or think about something. Uh, his brain will become active in certain areas and not others, given whatever the task he was asked to do, and the machine will detect this. Contrary to popular belief, fMRI doesn't actually measure brain activity. Uh, it measures oxygen levels based on blood flow, which can be used as a sort of proxy measure for brain activity, given that active neurons require more oxygen than the inactive ones. When hemoglobin in the blood loses its oxygen to brain tissue, it disrupts any magnetic field that it passes through. This disruption can be tracked by some pretty complex machinery and filtered out uh, from all the other type of unrelated brain activity with some equally complex statistics that I'm not going to go into any gory details about in this video. The images you see here are examples of what is produced in an fMRI and the scientists and engineers who use them. The color representing places in the brain that are proposed to be more active than others. now that we know a little bit about the tool, uh, how is it used in scientific research to figure out if people are telling the truth or if they're lying? Well, the typical neuroscience study of deceit goes a little bit like this. Bring a bunch of participants into a lab and get them to do something deceitful. You might get them to, you know, fake steal uh, one of several available objects from a locker. You then tell the participant, hey, if you can trick the scientist, we'll give you 50 bucks. So, you put this person in the fMRI and ask them what item they stole, knowing full well that they're trying to lie, and see what happens in their brain. This can be compared to participants that you tell to tell the truth. Of course, the scientists know because they have access to the lockers, and so, you know, they can tell the truth between, between lies and in participants. There are several studies that have been done that are just like this, or at least something similar, getting participants to lie versus being honest in laboratory settings eventually creating a kind of uh, brain model for lying. You compile the evidence from all these different studies together. In 2005, Kozel and his colleagues thought, well, knowing what we know about the brain structures that might be involved in lying, is it possible to tell a liar from uh, someone being honest just by looking at their individual brain scans? So they took 30 participants, got them to do something similar to what was just mentioned, uh, tried to predict what group they belonged to, the lying group versus a truth-telling group, and claimed a 90% accuracy rate uh, at telling liars apart from truth tellers just using their constructed brain model. To answer the question of how we use our brain to lie, we first need to understand what actually goes into lying and how it differs from telling the truth and the cognitive components that are involved. There isn't going to be some sort of lying center in our brains, but instead a wide series of different brain regions involved in complex cognitive tasks, such as creating false stories, uh, sometimes on the spot, withholding truthful information, sometimes called response inhibition, 
uh, short-term memory and complex planning if multiple lies are involved to keep track of your web as you spin it deeper and deeper. Uh, lying is also necessarily tied to emotion, as lying tends to induce anxiety, especially when you're dealing with emotionally intense crimes such as violence. Already we can see that there's a lot involved. Truth-telling, however, is mostly just reciting from long-term memory and the brain areas associated with the types of memories involved, like places, people, or timelines. So one of the regions most commonly found in lying studies uh, are a series of prefrontal parietal regions, meaning areas across the prefrontal and parietal cortices. The inferior frontal gyrus is one, seen here, often implicated in studies of behavioral self-control or impulse control, which, you know, you would imagine would be pretty important for lying, requiring self-control over the narrative that you present. If you give someone a task where they have to learn a simple set of rules, and they purposefully behave against those rules later on, the inferior frontal gyrus will usually become active. Various parts of the prefrontal cortex, like the medial prefrontal cortex or the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which cover large swaths of these areas uh, seen here, are implicated in deception. The medial and dorsolateral prefrontal cortex are implicated in all sorts of interesting cognitive behaviors like decision-making, uh, short-term memory, planning, and inhibition. Inhibition and planning in the context of lying would be important for withholding information and creating new information. Short-term memory for keeping track of your fake story. Uh, and these are things that you would presumably wouldn't need to worry about if you were telling the truth. The anterior cingulate uh, is often associated with something called error detection and conflict monitoring. Basically what this means is detecting and picking up when things go wrong or when things don't quite add up. Uh, and noticing conflicting information which sounds pretty important for lying, right? Other regions often found associated with lying are the hippocampus, a critical learning and memory part of the brain, and the fusiform gyrus, a very interesting part of the visual system that responds to human faces. Hippocampus, of course, would be involved uh, in almost any activity that required long-term memory, lying, or truth, and the fusiform gyrus would be active when thinking up mental images of people. So now that we've discussed some of the neurobiology behind the deception, can we piece all of this together to create a useful, practical model of lying in the brain, comparing criminal brain scans to that model to determine if they're lying or not? Well, uh, no. <laughs> uh, in fact, there's a whole bunch of reasons why fMRI uh, isn't really a viable option for real-world lie detection uh, and why it isn't used today, even if you can create a useful model of deception in the brain. The first is an incomplete and inaccurate model. The unfortunate truth is that brain areas are not these isolated islands of single functions, but are almost always involved in many, many functions because of how widely connected they are to everything else in the brain. The inferior frontal gyrus is critical for language processing, and so speaking and understanding words will activate it. In the prefrontal cortex, short-term memory could be just as important for remembering what you've already said, regardless of whether it was true or not, the anterior cingulate cortex is studied for all sorts of non-lying related functions like emotion, pain, and social interaction. Not only this, but the variability between individuals in their use of brain areas for certain behaviors is quite huge. For example, when you lie, there may be lots of activity in your prefrontal cortex, but what if you have attention deficit disorder, a learning disorder characterized by reduced prefrontal cortex activity? Does this affect the interpretation if you have less prefrontal cortex activity than everybody else going into the interrogation. Fortunately, this isn't something that's really been detailed out or studied. What this means is that, let's say you have lots of activation in the so-called uh, lie detection areas during your brain scan, there's almost no way of knowing for sure whether those areas were activated because they were involved in the creation of a lie or in some other process going on in, in that moment. Second, Lying in fMRI studies is far removed from real-world lying. Uh, in a study, participants are given a piece of information and told to lie about it. No big deal. There's really nothing on the line. In the real world, murders, rapes, arsons, theft are all immensely emotional and highly stimulating and serious events uh, that affects the criminal who perpetrated them. Uh, that fact will influence how they remember the events and how they lie in the courts, which makes the current model uh, not useless, but not as useful as it could or should be. 
and very preliminary. Third, and one of the biggest, is that all those cool images you see of brain scans do not represent single events from single people, but instead multiple trials, so asking people to lie over and over and over again, and combined images of several people, meaning that the images are aggregate averages of the entire study population. There's no guarantee that any individual lie from any individual person is going to look like that at all. And so you can't really test a single criminal with single questions accurately. The fourth is a limiting factor, and that's that fMRI can only be used in voluntary patients. Any movements, unrelated thoughts, high levels of anxiety and stress interfere with the results and create huge amounts of unnecessary uh, interfering activity. So you can't, you know, take someone against their will and put them in. You just won't be able to get any useful data out of it. Fifth is that there's no universal baseline to compare a criminal to. Every fMRI study is in its own way slightly unique in how the scientists and engineers create their images and develop their group comparisons. Individual people are also very different in their anatomy, and so because fMRI measures blood flow and blood vessel size and placement across brain regions vary between individuals, it's almost impossible to compare usefully the brain scans of two individual people. On top of all this, finally, there's really no way of figuring out uh, to what degree a person might be lying. Lying isn't just black and white, it's, it's actually a fairly complex behavior with many different types of lies existing, like withholding critical information, uh, small white lies versus the really big critical lies, or something called half-truths. And there's really no way of deciphering out between these types of statements using brain scans, at the current moment anyways. So in the end, brain scans as lie detectors seems to be kind of a dead end, which is really no surprise because that's not what fMRIs were invented for. It would seem that humanity is really no further along in developing a viable truth-telling technology. If you like this video, please like, share, and subscribe. Uh, and as always, have a great day.